Uh, so the examples then, as I said, t-test on over, they are the same principles as what you're used to. Because remember, we're using the same idea as what you did in your classical hypothesis testing tools that you already know. But the only thing with diff that is different is the inference that we have to calculate. That means the decision-making process that we have to calculate. We calculate that based on our random fields. Yeah? That's what we really do. So let's have an example of a t-test, for example. Well, a t-test um, is a single function that you would, would do, you would call on your data. In this case, what we have looked at is some data of knee kinematics in the three planes. Ignore the fact that we are assuming that they are all three individual. But what I'm going to show is for each of these planes, we have processed the same data in two ways, a direct kinematic way and an inverse kinematic way. Modelers and open sim users will know the difference between that. And here is the output, two different curves each time. So we have the direct kinematics as the full line and then the inverse kinematics as the dashed line. Now, if we want to know whether these are different or not, how do you go about with this? Well, with SPM, the easy way is to just do your T curve calculation. You put it underneath the curves and then you calculate your thresholds based on that random field theory to decide when they are meaningfully different. And so this is the same figure as you've already so seen before. But here, for example, you can see that throughout the entire stance phase or contact phase of this movement, there is a significant, very strong difference uh, between uh, these uh, two conditions. And remember, this is the same data. For us, this was quite striking because the frontal plane knee data is very typically used in this context of this research, but uh, I won't go further into detail. But remember how intuitive it is to, in to interpret this data now. If you're not used to SPM, then hopefully this will be an eye-opener um, in terms of seeing how uh, clearly we can analyze that data. Let's go to another example, ANOVA. So if we have an ANOVA test, you remember, we, for example, have uh, three conditions. So we'll take one application where we compared three different groups. We have a red group, a blue group, and a black group. Um, they are about people who have chronic ankle instability, people who have had an ankle injury but are copers, so they don't have recurrent problems, they don't have that chronic uh, ankle instability, and then a control group. It doesn't matter which is which here in this case, but what we have is we have the individual curves on the top left side here, then we have the averages and the standard deviations, which obviously are a bit tricky there to interpret, but most importantly, like you would normally do with discrete values, you can calculate an F value, which is, is there any difference between these groups without going into a post hoc analysis yet? And so that F value you can calculate over the entire stance phase. This is our F value. Yeah? And you can see there seems to be some sort of magnitude there that is exceeding a quite high level or is going to a quite high level with the benefits then that you can also do your inference calculation which is setting a critical threshold so we've got the same graph here but what we've got is we've only presented the f values that are exceeding the critical threshold which we calculated and which was in this case 6.746 for example and so now we can see that there are differences between groups at that particular phase your next question is then, yes, but we need to know which groups, isn't it? Well, that's ultimately the same thing, but remember, your hypothesis originally was, like you would typically do with an ANOVA, is there a difference, or rather, do we reject the null hypothesis that there is no difference between any of these groups? What we have done in the first place is we have actually rejected our hypothesis based on this result. Yeah. But we've done it based on a very... I would say objective measurement. It's not biased by focusing on anything, because how would you have focused on this here? Where would you have looked at? The average, I can guarantee you would have lost the information. Yeah. So then what we do is obviously a post hoc. And there we can do the same thing. We can do a post hoc t test in this case. So we calculate a t curve in this case again for chi versus con, chi versus copers, and con versus copers. What we see is there between people with chronic ankle instability and people who are copers. 
So they actually are fundamentally the same, despite the fact that they are different in terms of their response of not repeatedly getting the same injury again. But they actually behave in the same way, yet both of them, and this is on the left and on the right, are significantly different compared to controls. Yeah? Now, you can also see here, this is a nice example, a T threshold, the T curve can be positive and negative, dependent on the direction of your difference. So what we have is chi versus con. So the controls are on the second part here. So we're comparing the controls on the second part. So we have a negative difference in this case. In the other case, we have con versus coper. So con is on the first part, I would say, is in, in the first one. And so here it's a positive difference. Ultimately, what that means is that actually chi and con uh, sorry, yeah, chi and copers, they both differ in the same direction away from our controls, yeah, based on these outputs here. Let's not focus too much on that, but you can see that the T value actually tells you the direction of your difference in that T test. Now, what you will have spotted is for the F value, if I flip back towards that slide here, they are only positive. Why? That is only a distance that we're measuring in an F value calculation. If you go back to your standard statistics or basic statistics, you will realize that F values can only be positive. Because we're only looking if there is a significant distance between groups and the direction of the distance actually is not looked at. Yeah? Regression. So how can you do regression with this? Well, the same principle as before. Regression is ultimately a correlation. So let me walk you through an example of a publication that we had uh, where we looked at the effect of running speed during a side cutting maneuver on the loading in the knee joint. Don't worry about how we measure the loading, but the loading is in this case the valgus loading on the knee joint during that side cutting maneuver. So the question is, if we run faster, do we get a greater level of loading? Now what we have then is we have knee moments that I can present there. We have four different running speeds. 2 meters per second, 3 meters per second, 4 and 5, approximately, because when you let someone run, you can't ask them to exactly run 4 meters per second, but you can ask them to run between 3.5 and 4.5. So that's how we did our conditions. Ultimately, we have a spread of actual running speeds, because post hoc, or after doing the processing of our data, we can calculate the exact running speed based on center of mass uh, movement. And so what we have there is we have the speeds of 2, 3, 4, 5, and the higher the speed, the thicker and the blacker the line gets. So thin gray lines, not necessarily optimally presented there, but thin gray lines actually present um, slow speeds, and then thick black lines present high speeds. So how do we correlate this now? What you can start to do is do repeated measures ANOVA, and actually see if there's any differences between conditions. That's how people do it. But really, you're not after that. You're not after knowing the difference between these conditions. You're after the correlation between these conditions. So what we can calculate is for this particular individual now, we can calculate what we would call a beta curve, a correlation curve. And that correlation curve, what it says is at each time node, it tells you whether there is a correlation between the variation in speed as a value, and at that time node, the variation in moments. Yeah? I'm going to explain it based on this point here, where you see these high moments in the higher speeds. So a high moment is a high speed, and a lower speed will lead to a lower moment. That means there's probably a correlation there. Well, yes, your correlation in this case, the beta value there, is at this maximum. Yeah? So the correlation is largest there in the positive direction. Yeah, the beta value is positive. There's actually a negative moment. It's hard to see because the zero is, is there. That's the zero level. There's a negative time towards the end of the contact where you can see that the thick bold lines are now, or the thick black lines are now lower than the gray thin lines, which means that the higher my speed, the lower the values are at that stage. Whether that's functionally important is not important now. It's just a principle that I'm explaining through this example. Now, how do we go about, this is for one individual. We now want to do that for our group comparison. So what we want to do is, is this a systematic thing across the group? So what we calculate is for each individual, we calculate this beta curve. And this is now what we get here. The thick black line that you see here is actually the same as the one that you saw there for that individual. 
it just looks different because of the units. Yeah, it goes to 15 there. Well, actually, now this goes to 60. So 15 is the peak there of that particular curve. The other curves are the other individuals that I've put on top of it now. Yeah. So I have that now for all my subjects of my study. Now the question is, well, when is this meaningful? That's the question. So when is it a, a trend across my population that higher velocity running actually induces higher loads? Well, what we can do is we can do is a one sample t-test on these curves. What does that mean? I'm going to test if throughout all those curves, throughout the time, the actual curve deviates from zero significantly, meaningfully. And that is a one sample t-test. Yeah? But I'm doing it over time. So my next curve here is a t-curve that I've calculated based on a one sample t-test on this data of regression curves. And what I can see is that particularly during this phase here, I exceed my threshold, which was calculated based on the smoothness of those curves. I've exceeded that, which means that there I have a significant relationship between my running speeds and my moments in my knee joint. So I've now applied a regression without having to discretize my data in any way. I've been able to actually use my data as it is, and I can also observe my data as it is without having to report just an average or a peak or whichever. Which, again, does not invalidate those approaches, but in many of the cases that we tend to use uh, our data would probably be the more appropriate tool or the more, more appropriate uh, approach.